Hey, stackers, I know this is Griffin's week to handle the basement duties, but just a couple quick things before we hand over the reins. Number one, our 500th episode's coming up at the Stacking Benjamin Show, and it's been so great hearing so many fantastic stories from all of you. We are hoping that you might be able to do us one more favor and pitch in on our 500th episode. Here's what's going to happen. We'd like to share wins that you've had in the five years since the Stacking Benjamin Show and its predecessors began. So, Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and leave us your success story so that we can give you the virtual high five on our 500th episode. It's amazing. Mom can't believe what we made it. And we want to show everybody listening that we got lots of listeners who are doing some really cool stuff. So if you're doing something really cool and you started it in the last five years and it's a success story, no matter how small you think it is stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail and uh, leave us a quick message there and you'll make the show. Second, as I mentioned on Monday, I'm headed to Traverse City, Michigan, and I'm so excited because I love Traverse City. If you've never been there, you really got to go. And if you go, make sure you come on July 5th because Wednesday, July 5th at six o'clock, we're going to have a meetup at the Seven Monks Tap Room in Traverse City. That's a seven monks tap room in Traverse City, Michigan, six o'clock. Hope you can make it. Write me a little note if, you, if you're coming. So I know to, to look out for people. It might just be a couple of us, might be four or five. Maybe we pack the place. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Hope you can make it. Looking forward to hopefully meeting some of you in the Northern Michigan area. All right, let's get to it. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to a Wednesday Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but the ladies at Hot Yoga call me the Fintern. Is anyone else aware that it's Insurance Awareness Day? No? I got the joy of finding out at 3 in the morning. Why, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Apparently, Joe and OG decided to start celebrating at midnight because to these dorks, it's a national holiday. I'm sure you can guess what happened in the middle, but Joe thought it would be a good idea to leave me a 10 minute voicemail talking about all the joys of term versus whole life insurance. Apparently that debate will rage on because I couldn't understand more than four of the words he said. But to celebrate, I did see that he left episode 359 which features Dr. John Cotter and Holger Ratgeber, who many of you may recognize as two of the foremost authorities on all things leadership. How do you lead other people? Whether you're leading your family or people at the office, this is an episode for you. Of course, there's more. The guys will cover headlines, a voicemail, some old school snail mail, and of course, Doug will deliver his classic trivia. This episode originally aired on July 11th, 2016. While relatively recent, remember to ignore anything you hear about giveaways or investment advice. Finn, turn out. Hi, Milton. What's happening? I, 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 I didn't receive my paycheck this week. Um, you're going to have to talk to payroll about that. I did, and, and they said... Mel, they, we're going to need to go ahead and move you downstairs into storage B. No, yeah. but there's no space. So if you could it, just go ahead and it, pack up your it, stuff it, and move it down there, but, no, that would be terrific. I, I, I was no okay. I could stay. It, excuse me. You, I, I believe you have my stapler. from the basement that should never, ever change, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, it's Joe's mom's neighbor Doug and I am not my usual happy, easygoing self today. Everything was fine, but then I come down to do this professional introduction and somebody put different books under the microphones. How am I supposed to work without Susie Orman's Nine Step to Financial Freedom holding up the mic? And now they got Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover staring me in the face. And if that's not enough, the chairs are a couple of feet to the left of the way I left them last time. The table scooted up a couple of inches. Everything's all akimbo around here. This is officially a hostile work environment. I'm calling the ASPCA as soon as I wrap up. But, like the pro that I am, the show will go on. So here we go. On today's show, Joe and OG will get a lesson from the true professionals. 
here to tell them that changing things up is not how we do it here. Welcome the authors of That's Not How We Do It Here, Dr. John Cotter and Dr. Holger Rothgaber. Also, headlines about problems at a major international bank, a quota C hotline call calling out Greg. Who doesn't love Greg? This guy, that's who. Your letters, trivia that'll stick to you, and more. Without further ado, the two guys who are about to receive a valuable lesson in respecting workplace traditions, Joe and O J J J J G. I don't think Doug knows what Dr. Cotter and Dr. Rathgaver are going to talk about. It's funny because of all the people that like things exactly the same, I probably win that contest. Don't you think? <laughs> like I ordered the same food at the same restaurants. I never. I like my setup here. At the card table is exactly the same. I don't change. Did you borrow a Susie Orman book? <laughs> well, remember the bonfire we had last week for 4th of July? <laughs> don't, 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 don't. Susie, we love you. And if you want to come on the show. Too happy, bad. Happy, <laughs> happy to have you on the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the table from me, an ever-present surly Mr. <laughs> OG. It's an early morning this morning, but what are you going to do? That's it. But you got a new mattress. You should feel great. Feel great. Yes. You know how I bet you bought that new mattress? I bet you went to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Not that they have mattresses there, but as you know, OG, you can save $450 in higher interest, lower fees by changing up your checking account, your savings account, and your debt products. Magnify Money doesn't sell any of those things. What they are is a comparison site, and they compare 90%, over 90% of those tools that are out there, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money and you'll see how it works. And for the extra hundred dollars, I bet you use that on uh, high thread count sheets. You went to stackybenjamins.com forward slash SoFi to refinance those student loans because SoFi is the leader in marketplace lender when it comes to refinancing student loans. They also do personal loans and they throw in a hundred bucks if you work with them, which you could apply to the loan. You can send OG new sheets. You can uh, maybe buy uh, Doug some medicine to help him calm down about people changing out his books. Xanax. <laughs> Whatever you need. Stankovegements.com forward slash sofa. They also do mortgages, by the way. I always forget that. We got a great show, man. It isn't every day you have a Harvard professor on the show and a book about meerkats. We're going to talk leadership. That's what this is really about today, leadership. and a book about meerkats, huh? Yeah, a group of meerkats, and I'll let them explain it, uh, uh, get together. And, you know, it's it's how teams develop or families even develop. You see these these uh, teams where there's some founder and they're the smartest person in the room. And then later on, when people start to have other ideas, the founder can't let anybody else have an idea because that's not how we do it here. Mm. It's actually, don't tell Doug, but that's what the book's about. Fighting the, that's not how we do it here syndrome, uh, which happens a lot. So we're going to talk about whether you're leading the family or leading the charge at your business or you're following at your business. Good stuff there. But first, we got some important headlines, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. This is scary. Uh, this comes to us from website Zero Hedge. Tyler Durden wrote this. Deutsche Bank, which plunged on the Brexit news, is continuing to go down. They failed the Fed's stress test for the second year running, and they've been diagnosed by the IMF as the world's most systemically dangerous financial entity. The giant German banks getting slammed down again this morning as we record this. This type of news, if something happens to your bank before you go and do something stupid with your money, what happens, OG, when a bank collapses? Well, some of it will depend on the size of the bank, right? Whether it's a national bank like a JP Morgan or something, or if it's a local bank well, or credit union. This is Deutsche um, Bank, so we're talking Deutsche Bank. Big old mom. What happens is the FDIC comes in or the Treasury Department comes in and takes everything under receivership basically. And they process the orderly liquidation of accounts. Sometimes I've actually even seen it where they'll set up a separate like a new bank with just the assets of the customers in new co-bank, you know, and you don't actually even see the 
the impacts of that. You just, you know, your checks still work, your debit card still works, all that sort of stuff. It just gets switched over. And a lot of times they'll enlist the help of other banks. Like we saw in 2007, 2008 with some of the collapses yeah. then where they'll enlist other banks, which step in immediately and, and help out. So people get worried about liquidity. I think we don't have to worry about the 1920s again. No, well, you don't. I mean, at the end of the day, your money's insured to 250000 per account, per account ownership type. So individual account, husband has one, wife has one, they have a joint account. You know, they're going to be insured for those different accounts. But is, is there a chance, like we were talking last week, I think, about the money market funds, you know, and the illiquidity of that. Is there a chance that you go to the bank and they say, sorry, today we're closed and you can't get a cash withdrawal? Yeah, that can happen. It's unlikely, but that's not like a life sentence, right? That might be a long weekend, right? Where you, where that I I chalk that up as in the same category as you make a deposit, and for whatever reason, the bank holds the check for three business days, and you're like, Shisa, I need to like get that access to that money. They go, yeah, sorry, you know, it's not going to be available till Tuesday. What do you do? You just make do, right? You hurt for three days. Yeah, not the end of the world. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I worry about whenever these things start to enter our radar that people are going to go, you see people, they withdraw massive amounts of money. It's generally yeah. older people. They tell their niece or nephew about it. And next thing you know, shock of shocks, their house yeah, gets a, robbed. There's a whole line or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't go to the bank and take out 87,000 in hundreds and then go home. Somebody's that, You need to take that money and go right to a different bank. Somebody seeing this, even as early as we're recording this, somebody is seeing this headline and they're on their way to the bank right now. Yeah. Well, you know, so there's other ramifications that happen when you take cash out of an, out of a bank. Uh, one of the things that happens is if you take out more than 10000 or you repeatedly take out something like 9800 <laughs> anything over 10000 in cash that gets withdrawn, you are forced to fill out a form. It's called a currency transaction report. And if you don't fill that out, then the bank will fill it out for you because they're forced to do it, basically. And if you don't want to fill it out, they'll fill out one for you. And it's called a suspicious currency transaction report, which I'm sure is better. Yes. You definitely <laughs> don't want a whole bunch of $9,000 withdrawals out of your account in cash over the course of a couple of weeks. I have some friends and uh, know people who work in the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, the last I heard from them, 100% of currency transaction reports are investigated. Wow. Now, that may be just like somebody looks at it and goes, oh, yeah, you know, gee, you know, well, that never happens. But uh, right. so you go to the bank and all of a sudden you take out $80,000. Not only can, is you're not going to walk out of there with a suitcase in like 37 seconds, right? It's a whole day affair because you got to fill out forms and then are you going to take their word for it? Or are you going to sit down and count your own $87,000? But a human looks at every single one of those. A human point. looks at all the reports. So I don't know about you. Uncle Sugar don't need to be looking at none of my forms. <laughs> none of my junk. Right. Yeah, that's uh, th th please don't go take money out of the bank. Don't do it. Uh, next headline comes to us from Napa-Net, which is the National Association of Plan Advisors. This is written by Nevin Adams. Excessive fee lawsuit dismissed. Get this one. By the plaintiffs. And for people who don't know uh, because I was, I was have trouble with these legal words. I don't know. I don't know why, but the plaintiff is the person that actually brought the lawsuit in the first place. A recent excessive fee lawsuit's been withdrawn before the defendants could even respond. Less than a month after filing plaintiffs in the case of Danberg versus Lemetri's collision in Minneapolis filed for a voluntary dismissal of their lawsuit. The participant plaintiffs were part of a 114 participant 401k plan that had less than $10 million in plan assets. So this goes back to our show last week, OG, where, you know, John Oliver talking about his uh, plan and how the plan administrator charged them a ton of money. And it's it's funny when you have- charge them a ton of percentage points, but well, not a ton of money. Yeah, that's what I mean. A ton of, thank you, a ton of percentage points, but a low amount of money. What did they say? It was less than $1,000 yeah. to administer a 401k plan, which is a complex thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's funny to see that in the wake of that and the response that all of a sudden we have a plaintiff going, maybe we shouldn't file this lawsuit. Now, I don't know the reason why they wouldn't file the lawsuit, but- Excessive fee lawsuits, again, for a small plan, a difficult thing. 
This just reminds me, I have a real problem with this overall, the whole fee discussion thing, because I think it should be transparent and you make your own choice based on the facts at hand, right? It's like the story of the guy who makes widgets, you know, and he makes $10,000 a day and his widget machine breaks and, and he can't figure out what's wrong with it. So a day goes by and another day goes by and another day. And every day he's losing $10,000, finally calls an electrician, says, fix my widget machine. He comes out, he looks at it, 30 seconds later, fixes it. And the guy says, oh, thank you, thank you. How much do I owe you? The guy says, $10,000. He goes, well, I, I, I demand a detailed invoice. He goes, no problem. So he goes out to his truck and he writes an invoice. Part, $1.00 knowing which part to fix, $9,999. And in some case, I kind of feel that this is the case. You know, 401ks, like you said, are not easy to deal with. There's filing requirements. There's there's uh, liability issues. There's uh, fiduciary responsibilities that you have to adhere to. And if you don't have somebody on your side to help run that, you're going to have to take that whole activity under, you know, into HR. And you got to make sure... That your 5,500 forms filled out correctly. And what's the impact of not doing it correctly? What's the impact of not outsourcing that? So I have a problem when people are like, you know, oh, they, that's $1,000. That's that's too much money. Well, do you know how to fill out a 5,500 form? <laughs> you know, do you have the team of people, you know, responsible for for making sure that's done correctly and can back up the information and, you know, that sort of thing? But I do think that you have to have it, the information out public. You know what I mean? Yes. That, and I think that's the hidden message here is that it's not it's not about what you charge. It's about just put it out there so everybody can see Absolutely. it. And make a value proposition based on, yeah, we charge 1% or we charge 3%. I charge 3 because of this reason or I charge 1 because of this reason. Here's my value prop and here's what you get out of it. Yeah, then we can do a complete cost-benefit analysis. There's too much money. Yeah, you just pick what works best for yes. you and your firm. Same thing with financial advisors. If we all just came out clean and just said, this is how much we charge – this is my value prop. The yeah. market will dictate whether or not my value prop is, you know, good for my price, right? right. I mean, you'll get it pretty quickly. Yeah, you'll you'll either be playing Xbox all day or you, or you'll know you'll, the feeling. Or you'll actually be busy. Yeah, Just that's kidding. right. You sit around with your feet up all day, I'm sure. I've known you for how long? I don't know that that really happens. There's two parts to this game. Part number one is is that the company should do that, where they should be explicit about what the fees are. But yeah. also the committees inside these companies that make the decisions should also be on top of, okay, well, we reached this break point. Let's make sure that our employees get the lower price. You know what I mean? The lower pricing structure. Let's make well, sure that's that the we... Pro- I mean, again, no digging at the group of people we're talking about here because everybody needs their car fixed. But I think you said it's an auto repair place. Does bring in the lawsuit? Yes. Is that, is that yeah. it? Auto repair place. That's right. Traditionally, when you go, my, my brother's an auto mechanic, certified mechanic. He did not take any finance courses in school. You know what I mean? That wasn't the part of his college curriculum <laughs> that he that he elected. So the problem with that, Joe, is that who's on the board of that organization? Who's right. on the four hundred one k board? A whole bunch of auto mechanics, probably. Right. I think while it would be nice to have the checks and balances, I would like to know as a business owner that insert 401k provider here isn't going to screw me and just wait for me to come to them and say, hey, we crossed 10 million. We should get a lower rate. Right. I should be proactive as a 401k company and say, hey, you guys, you guys are at 10 million. You guys are at, you know, what? you guys are at 9.8 million. That's close enough. We're going to kick you over to the 10. It's like having a bunch of financial planners running a fleet of cars. Oh. Yeah, I can't imagine that would go well. <laughs> Not going to work the other way. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing the corollary. They'd all be used cars. <laughs> they, 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 they would. Like they 18,000 get... miles on them and everybody's like, why is my, why is my car yet? It's all Bondo. <laughs> bondo all over everything. Bondo and duct tape. Bondo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think our lessons today, number one is no matter what happens here with Deutsche Bank, you know, There are systems in place. This is not the 1920s. Please don't run and take all of your money out tomorrow and put it under your mattress, uh, Mr. Penzo. (laughs) And then number two is, now Len's money's already under his mattress. And then number two is these excessive fee lawsuits. You know, maybe dig into your 401k first, find out how it runs and see if you can participate in the committee at your company uh, before you just uh, start waving the let's go file a lawsuit flag around. I can't believe 
believe we got these guys coming down to the basement, OG. It's fantastic. Dr. Cotter, huh? Considered by many to be the man when it comes to talking about leadership, Dr. John Cotter is coming down to the basement along with his co-author, Dr. Holger Rothgaber. These two gentlemen a few years ago co-wrote a book, OG, called Our Iceberg is Melting, which was a huge book. Even before that, Dr. Cotter had written a book called Leading Change, which was just a little, little tiny book. Well, I read in uh, graduate school as well as uh, in my prior uh, roles as an advisor, one of the best articles on what leaders really do back in the early 90s. Just but, instrumental. Uh, widely, widely accepted as probably one of the best leadership articles in the history of mankind. Let me tell you a little bit about these two gentlemen. Dr. Cotter graduated from a little college called MIT with a Mitch. Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master of Science in Management in 1970. He has his Doctor's of Business Administration from Harvard Business School. He has received numerous awards. I think numerous is too small a number for his thought leadership in his field from Harvard Business Review. Bloomberg Business Week, Thinkers 50, Global Gurus, and and others. He wrote Leading Change in 1996, which is considered by many to be the seminal work in the field of change management. William Finney, editor-in-chief of Strategy and Leadership, described it as simply the best single work I have seen on strategy implementation. He talks about an eight-step process for change management. That's what Dr. Cotter talks about a ton. And actually, even today, OG, in in his book that we're going to talk about that just came out, that's not how we do it here, this book talks about making that change. And uh, uh, Dr. Rothgaber, on his end, (laughs) he's done a few things too. He's no slouch either. Not at all. Spent most of his career with Motorola and a little company called Becton Dickinson. Until recently, he served as vice president in HR Europe for Becton Dickinson and has worked and lived on three continents and has been intimately involved in decision-making, planning, and implementation of some of the most challenging business scenarios, including acquisitions, radical shifts, and go-to-market model and strategy and turnaround. What's cool about this book, OG, I think it had as much to do with leading a family as it does with leading a business. So whether you're somebody working in a huge business, a small business, or you're somebody just leading the charge at home, I I think you're going to love this interview with a great thinker and a great implementer of that thinking. Let's say hello to Dr. Cotter and Dr. Rothgaber. And John Cotter and Holger Rathgaber join us. Welcome to the party, guys. Thank you. (laughs) Welcome. I'm so glad you could be here to talk about this. I want to talk first about your collaboration because you two gentlemen are in very different places. So, John, we'll start with you. How did you guys come together to collaborate on this project, not just this one, but the project before this too? Dr. (laughs) Rathgaber sent me an email maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, about a exercise that he had kind of invented for his executive team to get them talking about and thinking about change. Uh, and it was building off of my work. I thought what he said in the email and some of the pictures he sent were absolutely brilliant. So I got right back to him. We eventually got together when he was in the United States and it all went from there. Uh, Holger or Dr. Rothgaber? No, put it in. Oh, Holger, please. Okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Holger, tell okay. me, tell me about that email. What exactly did you say to uh, to John that got him excited, got him hot and bothered? The email, actually, forgive me, John. It's thirteen years ago, and the email, which explains the difference of the two <laughs> stories, the email actually was a little pack of a document with penguin masks in it, a few pictures. And some photographs of that meeting where approximately 150 executives were running around with penguin masks and having fun. And actually, people loved it so much, they told me, you need to share that with John, which is basically his eight steps brought to a group that became actors in a kind of a crazy story of about melting icebergs and, and penguins. And I never thought that John would ever respond because for me at that time, he was kind of the, the god of leadership. He still is in a way, but in a different way now. But remember, John, what you told me first is when that little thing landed on your lap and you opened it, it was an answer to a question that had bothered you for quite a while, which is basically with 
probably not more than 0.5% of the world population reading business books. You just felt, how do I get to more people? And you had no answer. And these little penguins seem to be a very promising answer to a question that had bothered you for quite a while. That actually is my version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, a brilliant email. <laughs> But John, it is, isn't it? Isn't it the power of, of story? Because in this story, which we'll get to in a second, where we're talking about meerkats, but isn't it the power of story that helps reach more people? I'm thinking of other books, which just seems to be in the tradition of like, you know, who moved my cheese, that type of thing. The brain is hardwired for stories, for Darwinian purposes, if you think through that logic. Fables like this have been shown over the centuries to be able to kind of slip right into our brains and uh, connect to our kind of emotional systems and our visual systems and make a point and stick. How did you guys choose meerkats? I think it was an image of one little meerkat that was a guard and that was and the alertness, the agility and that character uh, just blew me away. So um I'm not even sure whether I dropped the message to John or he dropped it to me, but we both in a nanosecond were clear those are our actors in our next story. Set up the story of the meerkats and kind of tell us the fable, if you don't mind. Well, the story is about this clan of meerkats in Africa, these cute little animals that has had a distinguished history, been very successful, and then their habitat changes and they do what they know how to do. And people who want to do th things differently, they shoot them down with, you know, stop it. That's not how we do things here. And they start to collapse into, I mean, we've all seen it. They start to collapse into the kinds of situations that uh, unfortunately is all over around today. And a meerkat who is so frustrated that she can't believe that there's not a better way and, and takes the risk with a friend uh, actually uh, going out of the colony that she's uh, been raised in and looks around until she finds something that's very different. And in that very different, she learns a number of things, including the fact that this different, uh, very innovative, very entrepreneurial group works well until they get some scale and then they fall apart too. And it's the big idea she has about, wait a minute, there is a third way that could work in the kind of world we're in today among organizations of some size. And she goes back and kind of just uses her intuition and gets more and more help from others to try to start establishing that third way, despite resistance, despite barriers, despite everything in her old clan. And this journey is a journey of learning. It's a journey of emotional ups and downs. And ultimately, it's a journey of uh, victory that we can all learn from. You know, John, we're talking here about how great organizations rise and fall. And this addresses some very specific problems. Can you set up the issue for us that you're resolving in the book? Well, you know, the habitats are changing for governments right now in a big way in Great Britain and in companies around the world. And well-managed firms everywhere are struggling to adapt. Another thing we've known for some time is people muddle completely a lot of stuff about leadership because they mistake it with management. And if you can clarify that, it really does in a very foundational way, uh, make a difference. Another thing we've known for a long time is great startups operate totally differently than established organizations in terms of the basic actions, a lot more leadership from a lot more people working in a network, not a hierarchy. But as they grow, they've got to add that additional piece or they will just go off track. But as they add it over the life cycle of organizations, they tend to kill off what originally made them successful, the kind of the leadership entrepreneurial network. It's very basic stuff. It's very important stuff. And my dream, of course, like holders, is that because it's so accessible, 
it'll get in the hands of a lot of people and they will start talking to each other like people did with the Penguin book. It will provide a less threatening way of dealing with very important issues and it will guide them and with a language system to actually start taking some actions which can help organizations thrive in the kind of environments we've gotten uh, ourselves into today. This is actually interesting for another reason. As I read your book, I not only thought about startups and about organizations changing and, you know, I thought a lot about the ego of the founder, which I want to get into a little bit here and and where the idea comes from. We have a lot of people that listen to the show that just they're part of a family. And I even see this book speaking, Holger, to families about where ideas come from and leadership inside the family and how a family dynamic works. Do you think that this book also works there? There is this piece of authority and leadership that's not spelled out, but that's very obvious. And it can even be, it can be present in families where not always the person who makes decisions is the one who actually has the deepest insight about or even has the creativity to come up with a better idea. And the temptation is, of course, to shut things down. So you're absolutely right, Joe. This, is, this can happen in families. It can happen in teams. And, it, of course, it happens in meerkat clans. And, but adding to John's the big issue about organizations struggling with The two challenges, which is one is coping with keeping a a complex organization running day by day at the same time. There's a lot of discussions about disruption and disruptive technology, disruptive societies, and and basically coping with everything that comes at you and demands change. And with those two things, that's actually a big issue. And while people are getting older, organizations' lifetimes, actually, their lifetimes span is shrinking and you can even measure it. So we're talking about a big deal. But let me add one piece that I think goes into the story, which is more a personal issue. I work with groups and and sooner or later, someone will ask me, how do I become a better leader? I mean, I'm talking about leadership and change. and And of course, there's a long answer, but normally the short answer I'm giving is basically lead more. The big issue is not actually... The better leading, meaning people are not good at it, but it's just they're not doing enough of it and there's not enough people doing it. That's the much bigger barrier than the question about better. Part of the issue is, of course, that organizations, the way they function, they do not have enough people who are even in feel invited to provide leadership to their groups, to their teams, to uh, outside of their box, basically. So this book will speak a lot to people who feel like They want to do more than just what they are being told. They just do not know how to articulate or even how to build an alliance. And the book is about that, too. No, it's interesting. Reporters have asked me for some time now what 21st century leadership is going to look like. And what they're expecting is for me to say 21st century leaders will be more technologically sophisticated or 21st century leaders will have a bigger global view or something like that. And the best answer, I really do think, to what we need in the 21st century leadership is all about is we simply need more of it. <laughs> that yeah. More people from bottom to top actually stepping up, trying in their own way, with their own personalities, in their own styles, to lead. We've got just too little of it around the globe in companies, in governments, and it's hurting us. What is that, though, John? Is that empowerment where maybe the founder empowers more people, or is it setting up the system correctly when you're setting up the business or the government or the entity where you make it so that it's easier for people to express their opinions? Where's the issue? It's at a number of levels. Certainly, it is possible, and that's what the end of our our little book is all about, to create systems that open up the door for people to actually come in and provide leadership on important issues and in a way that really benefits the uh, organization. Traditional really great leaders throughout history have empowered people in, in the same sense. 
not necessarily with the same kind of structure and the same kind of processes, but they have open doors. That's a lot of what empowerment is for people to step up and lead. And also a huge piece of the problem is society and educational systems and organizations tell us in infinite ways from very young ages, most of us, that we're not leaders. You know, leaders are that incredibly small number of people, often with charismatic or dynamic personalities, that are going to run companies or run uh, countries. Leadership is not your thing. Having been pounded with that for decades, of course, a lot of people don't even think about it. Hence, uh, Holger's answer about, you know, what you should do is simply go out and try doing it. It is your job and it will help organizations and and it will make your life more interesting and more meaningful and more impactful in a family and in a company. But don't we feel, Holger, sometimes that if if I speak out, even if I think the ship's headed in the wrong direction, that I'm somehow being insubordinate? Yes. See, there's things that the moment you do something new, Joe, you will face barriers and issues like just the one you mentioned. You may just have one a really bad boss who just basically tells you in a more or less polite way to shut up and do your job. If you basically settle in that situation, it's your life that you're wasting. It's not the other person's life. So, of course, anyone who steps out of the traditional game faces some risks and faces some barriers. But they are there to test their commitment, not because other people or things are evil. It's just there's nothing like resistance. It's just testing your commitment. So absolutely, yes, you will face eyebrows up. You will face other issues. But boy, boy, you can also discover a person in you that actually you love if you basically begin in leading on issues that are critical for a team or for an organization, and you show others a way. Uh, jumping on, John, what Holger's saying, I think that it, it seems to me then that there's an approach, like there's there's a, a way to lead that people are more responsible to. Are there some cues that we can give the Stack and Benjamin's audience about what some of those cues might be? Yeah, screaming at your boss and telling me <laughs> leadership. That doesn't work? <laughs> No, really. <clears throat> a little humility never hurts, but talking about what can be done differently and uh, why that makes sense for the uh, group. So a constant sense of trying to help the group, not just yourself or your own emotional needs or your own career, that helps. Communicating as clearly as possible and not with gobbledygook. That always helps. Being straightforward increases your credibility. People don't think you're being a political animal. That helps. A little bit of passion behind it that demonstrates that you really care about this and you really think it could make a difference. That helps. There are probably, I don't know, Holger, there are a dozen things that you can do <coughs> one way or another to uh, your capacity to actually have a higher probability of trying to lead and actually succeeding. And, and a lot of it is common sense. People ask questions about leadership and they want some kind of uh, answers that are incredibly complicated, you know, that nobody would think of. And a lot of it is stop, stop. D don't do that. Don't give me the, you know, what's the latest, latest, latest? What are the, what's the latest concept? Stop, don't, don't stop, you know, stop reading except for my stuff. Use common sense. And most people have seen in their lifetime at least somebody that stood forward and helped provide some leadership in a group, in a family, in a church, in a company. Okay, what do they do? You know, you, you know it already. Just step forward and do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that keyword, do it, I find in any group setting that I'm in, it's very rare that we do not have enough ideas, that people do not have enough ideas. But the one piece that I think if you are truly leading, it always is it's associated with taking action. So not just talk about what you would do, but find a practical, simple way of getting started, of acting yourself into it, showing the results, which will get other people who tend to be probably skeptical, get on board because they see there's progress and there's something in what you're doing. 
So leadership has also to do with not just preaching and talking, but with doing. That's a very important point. I mean, both the, the fact that there are a lot of ideas around, but a lot of people think if they actually pause for a second and, and thought about the leaders they've seen that, that they thought were effective, they would know this is silly. But they somehow lock themselves into the notion that leadership is throwing ideas at a group and kind of crossing your arms and saying, OK, do something. <laughs> um, <laughs> leadership is, is not just generating stuff that other people have to sort out and go through the process of executing successfully. It's actually taking something, often an idea that's been around for a while, and actually stepping forward and getting started in making it happen, in executing it, in implementing it, in getting over some barriers and, and having it have an impact that's positive on the group. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and apparently the concept of that's not how we do it here has a slightly different meaning than I thought it would. Looks like I'm on my own. I think it's time for me to start leaving strongly worded notes to everyone down in the basement. I mean, come on. What type of sick, twisted bastard fixes a light bulb that hasn't worked in years? It's like I'm working on the surface of the sun now. And on a Monday of all days, it's a total shock to my system. Speaking of leaving harshly worded notes, here's today's trivia. We've all used and heard of Post-its. It's like those lovely little let's do better guys notes that I'm leaving all around the basement these days. Well, Dr. Spencer Silver of the 3M company first created the reusable adhesive used for Post-it notes back in 1968 on accident. So here's a question. What was Dr. Silver originally trying to develop? I'll be back with the answer after I write a note to remind OG to leave my pencils alone. I'm so excited to have two sponsors that we really love that are super helpful to so many people. Our first is Magnify Money. Check them out at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And if you're somebody like a lot of us that didn't get an education about money in school, well, guess what? Magnify Money will not only help you compare your checking, your savings and your credit cards. They also have a graduate guide. What's a graduate guide? Well, Nick Clements, CEO of Magnify Money, told us what it's all about. Right. Well, we went out and we pulled recent college graduates who are about five years out and said, what are your biggest regrets? And some of their biggest regrets were not handling their student loans right away when they got out of school, organizing them and finding out the the best way to pay and manage that going forward. And another was just not learning enough about about their personal finances. And so what we've done is based upon the regrets of people who graduated five years ago, we put together a checklist so that as long as you follow that list, you at least will not have the regrets, uh, the same regrets that these people have. There it is. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for you or the graduate in your life to get an education about getting their financial house in order. And if you've listened to the show before, you know I'm also excited about our second sponsor, SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi to check them out. And I've said in the past that you're not going to beat the interest rate on a student loan or on personal loans or mortgages outside of SoFi. However... I've also said you need a high credit score. What What is a high credit score and how does SoFi look at your credit? We asked Dan Macklin over at SoFi how it works. So there's no absolute minimum uh, that we have, but generally if you're in the 700s and above, then then you have a great chance of being approved. But credit, is, uh, credit score is not the only thing we're looking for. There's a variety of measures, but it's one of them. So even though it's not the only thing they look at, it's an important qualifier. So clean up your credit and then head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi when you're ready to get your mortgage, refinance your debt through a personal loan, or look at those student loans to get the interest rate down to something more manageable. Trivia fans, this is Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, here to... Hey, who the f*** moved my stapler? My whole setup is off now. 
The instructional post-it notes that I left for you are there for a reason. Post-it notes. Okay, here was the question again. When he developed that adhesive that's used on post-it notes for 3M back in 1968, what was Dr. Silver originally trying to develop? The answer? Well, at the time, Dr. Silver was attempting to create a super strong adhesive that would never, ever unstick. Instead, he made the opposite, something that just kind of stuck temporarily. Obviously, his failure is our gain. When Post-it Notes came out in 1980, they were a big hit. Apparently, the monsters down here in the basement haven't quite caught on to them yet. See ya! Oh, you nailed it! You never thought I'd get that one, did you? I'll even take it a step further. So, the reason that this took off was because he had trashed this whole idea. Right. Like it was, you know, this is the worst thing imaginable. So he had all this extra stuff left over. So what he did was he took these post-its basically and he used them to mark his spot in his hymnal at church. And when everybody saw him, they're like, what are you doing? Putting like a sticky thing on the hand. He's like, yeah, it doesn't really stick. It just kind (laughs) of it's a piece of crap, you know. (laughs) <laughs> and that's where somebody was like, uh, that actually might be a pretty good idea. They so might, then he, that's how it kind of, that's a sub story to that. It's just the too, only reason I know that is because a good friend of mine used to work for 3M. It's just too bad that Doug figured out what they were for. Well, you know, not good. You still got to mess with his pencils. Just God fun. bless America. I got that one right on the head. That was just, that was 100% accurate. Got to also say a big thanks to Dr. Cotter and Dr. Rothgaber for coming down to the basement uh, While they didn't create post-its, they really did create the whole genre of leadership change. You know what's exciting? After all these years of these guys talking about it, the excitement in their voice talking about leadership, like it's just so exciting. Like I found myself, even as I'm interviewing them, getting more excited about the book because of their exchanges back and forth. Uh, just on this topic that you th- they've been they've been talking about for years, and obviously the stuff we're talking about on our show is leadership one hundred and one, right? I mean, be passionate. Don't go yell and scream at your boss. I think I think though, not being afraid to lead is a great message. When you find your passion, you never work. Isn't that what they say? Like it's this is what's in their soul. So it's not work for them to write books and to talk about it. This is this is what they love to do. And I agree with what Dr. Rothgaber said during the interview, which is, you know, this garbage that only a few people can lead. Like, how many people have you met in your life, now that you're a little bit of a seasoned person, oh, gee, that, that, that when you first met them, they were horrible leaders, but you watched them grow into very, very good leaders. Like, I'm thinking of one woman in particular that I knew, just a horrible leader, and I thought she was such a dimwit just absolutely not the brightest light bulb out there. And man, she developed into such a good leader. And you know why? Even though she herself did not have the answers to a lot of the questions, she always knew how to surround herself with the right people. And she also knew what the end game was that they were driving for. And just those two things. I mean, anybody can lead. I totally agree with them. Well, military is a great example of that, right? They could take 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds and put them in charge of multi-million dollar operations and multi-million dollar machinery and groups of people. And I would think that there's probably a propensity to be a leader, you know, in terms of personality style. Sure, but I still... But that doesn't preclude anybody else. Right, and kind of what I'm saying. don't be afraid if you've never been a leader before to step up to the plate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's uh, go to the courtesy hotline, guys. Courtesy, why spend time with boring insurance agents for hours and hours when with just a few simple keystrokes, guess what? You can find out how much insurance you need, and then you can also look at 17 of the top insurers in the land to find out what your best deal is. There's also an easy button on the site for disability insurance, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash quotacy, Q-U-O-T-A-C-Y. And up today on the quotacy hotline, it's our friend Adam. Say hello, Adam. Hi, Joe and OG. Adam here. Love the show. I've been subscribed for over a year now, and this is by far my favorite podcast. A little background. So my wife and I have agreed that it's time for her to leave her job and stay home with our two-year-old daughter full time. We can live on my income alone if we cut back a little bit, but unfortunately my employer has had a rough year and has announced layoffs in the next few months. 
We have saved a healthy 10 plus month emergency fund in cash, have much equity in our home and have a healthy retirement fund for our age. I religiously track all of our accounts and look at dozens of different ratios to make sure everything is balanced. I sense a tear of joy forming in OG's eye. <laughs> if you're still awake, here's my question. What would you recommend for a young family on the edge of losing two incomes, one voluntarily and potentially one involuntarily? I have begun dabbling in some side hustle ventures, but none have taken off yet. Oh, and can you ask Greg if he kisses his mother with that mouth? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Appreciate the feedback. Uh, well, first of all, if, uh, Adam, you know, the relationship Greg has with his mother, I'll tell you, he doesn't, but, but I don't think that's what you were alluding to. Oh, that's fantastic. That is so good. Uh, uh, oh, gee, we got a, we got a problem here. Adam definitely has, uh, some stuff to worry about. Here would be my advice. First of all, under no circumstances would I let my wife quit if there's any chance that you're going to lose your job. If that's kind of how things are going, that's how it looks like it's going, go find a new job. Be proactive in that and kind of preempt that. Leave before you have to. Leave before you have to. While you have a cash reserve that's 10 months and you can manage your expenses and all that sort of stuff, you didn't say what kind of work you do. So maybe you're in a really specialized field that might take 10 months to find new work. If you're the higher up you are in an organization, the more upper management, senior management uh, roles that you have, those are harder to come by and harder to replace. I think they say that it takes you one month for every year of experience to find a replacement job. So if you've got 20 years of experience, you should plan on spending 20 months looking for a similar role. Now, it may not take that long, obviously. I wouldn't go into it eyes wide shut of, well, maybe it'll work out. Here goes. You know, that's kind of going off Niagara Falls in a barrel. They're just kind of hoping that you survive. You know what's going to happen, right? You're just like hoping not to drown along the way. So I wouldn't put myself or my family in that situation. You know, if you're in a position or in a career that's uh, reasonably transferable, you know, probably shouldn't be hard to find new work. And I go find new work I'll and then you. let my wife quit. I like your phraseology, though. Let my, I, I wouldn't let my wife. I know Mrs. OG. There is no let my wife or not let my wife. I think it's a discussion between the two of you. I get. You know I, what I mean? I yeah. Just, he did say we finally made the decision, but yes. but we would undecide that pretty quick. <laughs> I just, I just had to rib you a little bit. Yeah, yeah Mrs. OG wants to retire too, and tough. <laughs> <laughs> You need her to pull weight for two. Well, at the beginning of Adam's call, that's what I was going to tell him to do. He's like, uh, she. D we decided that she would stay home. I'm like, no, 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 no. She needs to keep working and you stay home, right? That's the that's the ticket right there. That would be a good short-term thing. Like if you're going, yeah, well, the reason is because daycare is super expensive. Or maybe she would uh, leave her work because she makes less money and the daycare cost is too expensive. You know, that sort of thing. I would just punt on it. It's still not a life decision, right? But right. Could you, can you punt for three months? Can you go, okay, this summer, I'm just going to find new work that I know is a little bit more stable or I feel is a little bit more stable anyway. And then, you know, she can, uh, she can leave her job, you know, in September as opposed to July. I like his proactivity because I think talking about leadership, you know, being able to see the writing on the wall from a little ways away. I think a yeah. lot of us, when it comes to layoff time or in denial, I certainly have had discussions with clients where even in, in our meeting, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, there have been a lot of layoffs. Maybe maybe it could happen. Like the first time they'd ever thought about it was right. me bringing it up that maybe their job's not as stable as they think. The other thing you can do, too, is you can use that as a, and this may seem a little corny, but you can use that as a little bit of a bargaining chip. You know what I mean? Like when you're, you, you find a new role, right? Maybe one that excites you. And then, you know, you can go back to your current company and say, you know, hey, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but it looks like things are going sideways here. I got an offer at XYZ company. Right. I mean, I love it here. I want to stay, but I'm really concerned that tomorrow afternoon you're going to tell me to pack my stuff. Where, you know, where do I stand? And there's nothing wrong with asking that. Now, they may lie to you, right? And that just shows the colors of the, of the, the character of those types of, you know, those people. But 
I know if I was if I was a manager, if I was a boss, and I had an employee that said, "Hey, I think that things are going upside down here." I went out and got new work. I don't want to leave, but I'm able to do it. It doesn't affect my family. What do you think? I'm going to be straightforward with that person. You know what I mean? I'm going to say, you're right. Things are tough. I take the job. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know, if I care about my people, yeah, I want you to, you know, I want you to succeed. I'd rather not burn any bridges. And I'm thinking know? if you think the person's lying to you, anyway, you know that in your heart. I mean, not all the time, but most of the time, yeah, like I've know. had that happen to me. And, and I, I said, well, maybe this time they're a different yeah. animal and they're yeah. not. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I had a situation just before I left being a financial advisor with another advisor where there was some stuff we were doing together, and I just kept thinking, this guy's a rat. This guy's a total rat. This is going to end badly. Yeah. And and then the cops showed up, and you're like, I knew it. (laughs) The cops didn't show up, but it turned out he was a rat. Like, I knew all the time. And other Uh, people. Snitches get stitches. (laughs) Other people. That kind of rat. Other people. No, not that type of rat. No, no, just a loser. Just just a guy that I should not have been working yeah. with. And I got talked into it and I kept saying, no, I don't think this guy, I don't yeah. really care for his moral fiber and uh, just a little off. Compass was a smidge skewed. Yeah. And turned out that I was right on. Like I, I saw a guy get arrested it. when I was an advisor. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Like an advisor get arrested. Like an advisor get arrested for, yep. for, for, in his office. For advisory stuff. For advisory stuff. Yeah. Early in my career. Yep. All right, uh, let's move on. Thanks thanks for the note, Adam. I hope that was helpful. If you have a note for the Quotacy Hotline, see how easy it was, by the way, to record that? Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and that is the Quotacy Hotline. So stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail gets you there. Uh, we also get letters, and Doug brought down the mail in a huff, and he's got a Post-it note on the mailbag here that says, make sure that you pick up your trash. So thanks, Doug. Anita, our friend Anita, longtime listener, writes this. She also heard your glide path rant. Oh, gee, <laughs> you can tell. I don't her. even remember this, so <laughs> it must have been pretty good. She says it was in May or something, wasn't it? Yeah, there was a lot in there. She said, but so we're not here all day. I'll pick the most glaring thing. He referred to the bucket strategy as dollar cost averaging, and I wrote back that I didn't that I didn't remember you doing that. By the way, okay. What's the rest of the question? Seems to me it's the exact opposite of dollar cost averaging. It's a market timing strategy. Think about it. You're choosing an arbitrary point at which to hold when the client will theoretically freak out and panic sell, and then an arbitrary point at which to sell, either when the cash runs out or when the market's up to some arbitrary point, I guess. Based on market movements, you decide when to spend from the cash bucket and even more dangerous when to replenish the cash bucket. Is this not market timing? Why yeah, not? That's, that's, that's pretty fair. You want me to just go right there? Well, well actually, let me finish She's, because she has a solution. She says, why not do a true dollar cost averaging method Instead, pick an allocation that makes sense for 30, 50, 100 years, 60 to 40 maybe, and maintain that allocation continuously, religiously. Take your 4% annual withdrawal from the side that's high, transfer as necessary, simple, no fuss, no triggers, no ins, no outs, no psychology, just sell high, buy low, consistently, forever. She said, am I missing something? I wrote back that I thought that was kind of what you were saying, that you guys, I think, are singing off a very similar song sheet. Well, kind of. Uh, She's talking about the cash bucket, and I see her point on this. I agree exactly with what she said, except that it would never works ever, never, never, because where it doesn't work is when you go, I can take it, 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 oh, I can take a little more, God, it's down 30%, I'm doing something wrong, I gotta, I gotta do something, right? That's where the plan goes awry. So the cash strategy, the way that this, the way that this works is it allows you to take that part out of it. So let's say that you have a portfolio of a million dollars and we're taking 4% out, $40,000 a year, right? So I would have a portfolio of $920,000 and $80,000 in a cash bucket. My 920 is heavily invested in equities, right? We've established that, that I'm not a big fixed income fan. But I, I, I did not know that about you. Yeah, 920 is heavily invested in cash. But I'm going to have the discussion with my client. I'm going to say, okay, you have $920,000 today. It's going to grow and, you know, it's going to go up and down and sideways and so on and so forth. But there's a good chance that it can go down and really kind of feel like it went down a lot and, you know, kind of hang out down there for a while. At what number of portfolio do you become concerned? 
And by concerned, I mean, when would you throw the plan off track? Because everybody does. Everybody has a number that they go, I'm going to change something. And I believe that the best course is to not change anything. But most people, not most people, almost everybody has a point at which they change something. It's some number. So we base this in some facts. Fact number one is that the average intra-year market decline is 14.2%. So you can't pick a number that's higher than negative 14.2. You can't say, well, at 10% down, I'm going to get concerned. No, nope, too bad. 14.2 is the average. So he's got to be numb. So maybe you'd say, oh, gee, I got 920. If I saw that account hit 750, if I saw 750 on my statement, I would be really puckered up. That would... I would really want to have, you know, that's probably when I would really want to start making a change. So we'd look at that and figure out the math on that. So 750 from 920 is a 19% decline. So 20%, let's say, right? So we go, okay, if the portfolio is down 20%, we will stop taking money out of the equity portion of the account. So it goes down from 820 down to eight or 920 down to 800. We stop taking money out of the 800. And now we have two years worth of distributions to take out of cash. The reason that there's the cash portion is so that now we can let the 800 just hang out for two years. Again, fact number two, most bear markets last about how long? 20 months, right? So if we've got two years worth of cash and we didn't time it and say, well, today's the day the market's going to start going down, we're just going to let it sit there. So we're not going to rebalance, we're not going to do any of that stuff. In theory, what happens is that by the time that that bucket of cash in two years has run to zero, my portfolio, which had declined to, let's say, 800,000 and maybe below, if you take like a 2009 time period, 2008, we've just put it out of our mind. It's now back to its original value two years later. It's not 800 anymore. Now it's a million again, let's say. Now I can take my cash out and I would do that in one lump sum. I wouldn't pick a day. I would just say today's the day. I Arbitrarily nothing. I would just, today's the day. We're out of cash in the cash bucket. Time today's, to go. Today's the day we fill it back up. And now we're going to start doing reverse dollar cost averaging again, back out of the equity portfolio. So it's not, I'm not going to use the ebbs and flows of the market to decide when to put cash in and take cash out of the that sort of thing. That emergency cash bucket is for the you know, the all hands on deck and I got to like switch from one to the other. If right. That kind of helps. Great question, Anita. Uh, as always, thanks for the question. If you've got a question for the mailbag, head to my email, joe at stackingbenjamins.com and we will get that on the air. Also, big thanks, by the way, to everybody who leaves us a review on the show, whether it's on Stitcher. Uh, I don't think you can leave a review at Google Play yet. Uh, and somebody will probably. Jerks. Somebody will probably say, yes, you can, Joe, and you're missing them all. Or on iTunes. And we've been going through the iTunes reviews recently, so let's continue that today. This one's going on Mom's Fridge. A big thanks to Hannah Rounds, who gives us five stars, and her headline is worth six stars. (laughs) Hilarious and full of great advice. If you know you need to take care of your finances, but you don't know where to start, this podcast is a great place to start. Hannah, I hate to argue with you, but... Do you think if somebody doesn't know where to start that our podcast is the perfect place? (laughs) I would would beg to differ, Hannah. I would say if you want to be mildly entertained and annoyed by Doug, then yeah, listen. But uh, starting with us, eh, I don't know. Anyway, she says, sorry, it took me a year and a half to leave a review. I just figured out how to reset my Apple password. I guess that's what you get for making a podcast for the rest of us. That's hilarious. Thanks, Hannah, for the awesome review. Mom loves it, which means it goes on the fridge. And if you could do that, too, that helps new listeners figure out what the show's all about. Thanks a ton. it big 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 episode today it's a special day when you have two guys like dr john cotter and dr holger rothgaber down in the basement i did notice we did clean it up a little bit for them so leadership and doug has no idea that's why the chairs were were moved i mean yeah we had to 
We had to do that. So we dust it uh, off a little bit. Right? Big thanks to them for coming down to the basement. If uh, you're looking for a great book on leadership to read, you could do a lot worse than reading Dr. Cotter's stuff. I think that's probably the takeaway here, isn't it, OG? Do yourself a favor and read it. I mean, what leaders really do? Gosh, what a great, what a great article. 12 pages, PDF, Google it. Yeah, if you start and there. go buy the book. Yeah, if you start there, then we'll work through his penguins from a few years ago and then go into the meerkats here. I think you've got a nice trifecta on leadership. Just a great place to start. And if you want to help the show, buy them from our store, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash store, and uh, you will help us out as well. Hey, other things. Let's talk about other lessons. Problems in banking. Okay, maybe you, OG, you change from one bank to another you know, and you do that in an orderly fashion, but there's no sense in moving money out of a bank and under your bed. If you do move it to your bed, be sure to text me to come sleep with you. What, uh, what, <laughs> what, that's weird. That's not what I was getting at. Um, yeah. what's your address and when are you going on vacation? Uh, I wasn't talking about that in a sexual way. I'm just saying that you might want to test out the, the mattress. That's also still nope. probably not working. No. Nope. We've got uh, Dr. Cotter and Rothgaber listening to this going, why are we on the show? Hey, speaking to the show coming up on Wednesday, Wednesday, we have another awesome guest, Jaquette Timmons coming down to the basement. She is one of the most dynamic speakers. This woman's speaking, speaking, <laughs> <laughs> this woman be speaking, this woman speaks everywhere, OG. And uh, uh, she is a longtime money coach who helps people realize that it's controlling your decision making that's the key, right? Success does not start with your wallet. So we're going to talk about fear. Everybody fears, including Jaquette, fears looking at your money, right? Have you ever had people tell you this? You know, I, uh, I, I really didn't want to come in today, but I'm glad I did. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So everybody fears it. So how to work past the fear and what the important things are to look at. Jaquette Timmons, who's just a little, has a little charisma. She's, she's going to be here on Wednesday. So we'll see everybody then. Special thanks to Dr. Cotter and Dr. Rothgaber of That's Not How We Do It Here. You'll find it wherever books are sold or from our show notes on stackingbenjamins.com. Also, special thanks to the UPS driver for bringing me another stack of post-it notes. I just need a couple of more post-its to tell the guys where to park their mopeds and maybe I can finally turn this show around. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor LLC, copyright 2016. The show is created and written by Joe Sal Cihai and edited by the amazing Steve Stewart. You know, Joe, I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. Okay, okay. I, I had a whole different thing planned, but when you roll out the handcuff story, th- th- there's no way we can't talk about handcuffs. So what are you doing? You're sitting in your office. Yeah, I wasn't even in an office at that point. I was still kind of in the uh, conference room. New, yeah, like a new advisor kind of new advisor. Um, what you might call it there? The bullpen. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess that's kind of maybe what they call it. But anyway, so yeah, and the guy that was his office was behind us was always a, you know, he was always helpful, right? Like, oh, hey, if you guys need anything, you know, I'll be happy to show you how to do this or talk to you about that or whatever. Was he, he was a big a, producer? It's hard to say. 
I just, I, I was, my son and I were talking about work yesterday and um, he said something about how long I've been doing this. And I told him, and I said, you know, what's interesting is that last Friday, July 1st began my 18th year doing this. I can't believe it's been that long. So I, I can't, uh, I can't remember, you know, and plus whatever his production was, so to speak, you know, objects in mirror, probably bigger than they appear, you know, and, and, you know, when you're brand new, somebody that makes a thousand bucks a month is making more money than you. That's a big producer. So I can't remember anyway. Uh, yeah. So we're just hanging out, you know, I don't know if you, I can hear what a police officer sounds like. You know what I mean? Like, they got so much crap on them. They, you know, they make noise when they walk. And you could hear around the corner, like this hush comes, you know, you can hear people start to like throttling up of everybody's attention. Right. And around the corner come these two police officers. Right. And I turn around and I'm like, oh, boy. He opens the door. And you can see him immediately like go to close the door. Right. Like, Did he really? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I mean, what would you do if a cop showed up at your door? Would you just like, come on in? Right. Like your kind of immediate reaction might be like, I didn't do it. Right. <laughs> and he kind of opens the door. He's like, hey, can, oh, you know, and they're like, they say who he is. And he's like, yeah, they're like, you're under arrest. Come with us. And he's like, oh, um, wh- uh, what is this about? And they're like, you know what this is about. Did they say that? Oh, yeah. And they cuffed him and out he went. And uh, that was the last time we saw him. But, um, you know, so the rumor mill kind of went a little crazy. But uh, I think the newspaper had a story in about it. Um, basically, he was, uh, you know, taking clients' money, putting it in his bank account, sending them handwritten statements, that sort of thing. You know, oh, I, you don't need a statement from, from the company. I, I sent you that Excel list. The quarterback are- of my high school football team ended up going to jail for running a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, I don't know that this was a Ponzi scheme. I think you just took people's money. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about this was a big operation that this guy oh, had. Okay. Yeah. He had he had other people working for him, and they had supposedly a, a, like a big business. They named their business. I don't remember exactly what the name was, but it was something like RBC Financial, and it, oh, yeah. and it was Rich Boys Club. Nice. I think that was what it stood But they never told anybody that that's what it stood for. Of course so, not. So it was RBC Financial, Rick, Rich Boys Club Financial. And I guess that uh, Johnny was his name. Johnny uh, drove her like super, Johnny Football? Super expensive. He was Johnny Football. He wasn't that Johnny Football, uh, but his name was Johnny. And it wasn't John either. It was Johnny. Uh, and so, but Johnny was, drove a uh, really expensive car and always had on these, you know, uh, Italian suits and uh, just, just, look like a million bucks and was ripping people off non- yeah. nonstop. Yeah, so this guy did too. Uh, nicest guy, but uh, but yeah, just apparently. Uh, well, Johnny, I didn't even know him at the time. I just opened up the newspaper and I'm like, there's no way that's the same one. So I go and I start doing some homework. I'm like, oh my God, that's the same guy. Nice. It's the same guy. Like I remember him from high school yeah. and, and he was always kind of, uh, I won't say shady character, but he was always kind of just a, just a little slimy, you know, mm-hmm. Johnny, I was like doing things the quick way. Yeah. So, well, shocking. Yeah. He was the one marshmallow guy. So did this dude, but, um, what's yeah. the, what's the one marshmallow guy mean? You know, the test with the one marshmallow, or one marshmallow. Now two marshmallows later, they do the kindergartners. No, come on, dude. This is like one of the most famous tests ever in his existence. No. So they put all these kindergartners in a classroom or individually, right? And they had a plate and on the plate had a big marshmallow. And they said, do you like marshmallows? And they're like, yeah. And so he said, okay, listen, if you, if you, you can have the marshmallow right now, but if you wait until I get back, I'll give you two marshmallows. And then they left and videotaped them. And the fun, I mean, it's the funniest thing to watch these kids, like five-year-olds, like trying to pry themselves away from like staring at the marshmallow. But what they found out was the ones that did, the ones that waited for the two marshmallows later in life were the delayed gratification people. Wow. The ones that just said, screw it, uh, it's a marshmallow, I'm going to eat it. This is what it is. Those were the pay me now guys. I don't don't know anything about that. I I remember the the one they did, that cruel one with... uh, with the young kids where the teacher said, you know, all the blue eyed people or whatever are bad and all the, and they had like these little kids discriminating against each other and the teacher was leading it. Right. Just showing them like, Oh, Oh, that one was, was big. Anybody with brown eyes 
is is dumber than anybody with. And it was amazing because the second the teacher said that anybody with brown eyes was dumber, like the rest of the class just jumped all over him, just totally jumped all over. And then it was funny because then a couple of days later, she did the turnaround. She's like, I'm sorry. I read it wrong. People with brown eyes are actually smarter. And what was bad was that even though the people with brown eyes had been hugely discriminated against the last few days. Oh, they just just drug the blue-eyed people through the They dirt, turned around and did the same exact thing back. Oh, I can tell you. My kids did a swimming meet, and uh, they got the ribbons a couple days ago, and my oldest got a second-place ribbon and my uh, and a fourth place. And my youngest, my, my middle kid now, got a third-place ribbon. And he said, my oldest goes, Dad, I'm going to tell the other one that – I got a fourth place and he's going to go, ha ha, I got third. And then I'm going to go, boom, second. <laughs> and it happened just like that. He goes, he comes up, the little one comes up and says, how'd you do? What'd you get? Ribbons did you get? And, and my oldest goes, I got a fourth place, but here's yours. And he looks at it and he goes, ha ha, I got a third. And he starts dancing. I got a third. And, and my oh, oldest and the- looks at me with kind of a twinkle in his eye, <laughs> winks and goes, Oh, I forgot this one. Boom. Second. What's up? What's up? <laughs> so at nine and seven, they're, you know, they're exactly like that. They're, they're already predators. It's funny. Yeah. Just the vindictiveness of that. Yeah. And you could see it. Like, it, I, I was like, as soon as he told me that, I'm like, I should stop this. Like, but I got I to gotta watch it because it's going to be funny. <laughs> Every parenting bone in your body says, stop it right now. You're Not like, every parenting bone. <laughs> yeah. no. It's just a, just a big plate of humble pie for my middle one, right? Oh, that's great. Like, oh, I got third. Boom, second. What's up? <laughs> and fourth. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, the other one only does one race, so. All right. We'll see you on. I got to go. See you on I Wednesday. Potty. Can I go potty now? Uh, please go. <laughs>